Hello, everyone. Um, it is fantastic to be here. It is actually very funny for me because there are some of my ex CNCF colleagues sitting here who I didn't know would be coming today. So uh, hopefully, I'm not going to embarrass them too much with this talk. So my talk is kind of in two parts today. The first part are three of the things that I learned from my last couple of years at CNCF that really changed how I think, and I think can could be useful lessons for all of you. And then secondly, some of the predictions and trends that I see coming up for cloud native. Um, I first gave this second piece earlier this year in March, so I'll be very interested to hear from you whether you agree with these predictions or whether you have seen something different or you think there's something missing. A little bit about me and my background. Um, I started out at Google as a engineer on the Google Maps team, so writing C++, deploying it using Borg. Um, when I left Google in 2015, that was when containers was just about coming up, so, and Docker, so I moved into infrastructure because I thought, I thought Borg was pretty great, so let's see if we can get the rest of the world to adopt this as well. Um, I started the Cloud Native London meetup, which is how I got into the community. Um, and then I joined CNCF a few years ago to drive the adoption of Cloud Native across the industry, particularly with end users. Um, and as of three weeks ago, I am officially at Apple. So now I'm an engineering manager driving the adoption of Cloud Native within Apple. Um, and to get the awkward bit out of the way, um, this is, I'm also pregnant, just in case, like the pandemic's been, you know, I know a bit tricky, but like, <laughs> I'm a bit pregnant as well. So um, I'm, I'm actually particularly happy because this is my first in-person talk for 18 months and it's probably my last one for the next six months. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here. I really mean it, thank you. All right, so I have three things I learned at CNCF. So these three stories are called after CNCF, you could be, failure is an option, treat your career like a portfolio. Um, so the first, first thing is like, what makes CNCF different from the other companies that I worked at? CNCF is a nonprofit, right? it's a foundation. Uh, it doesn't actually sell any of the open source projects that it's based on. Obviously it sells memberships and tickets to events and so on. But the real goal of CNCF is to be a neutral ground for all of these projects so that when you are building infrastructure on top of them, you can assume it will be there for the next 5, 10, 15 years. So the whole mindset around CNCF is a little bit different from most companies that are focused on selling products or selling services and that are focused on profits. So the first, the first one comes from when I was interviewing at CNCF. So I was sitting in my kitchen, waiting for this phone call, um, a little bit nervous, you know, and uh, I picked up the phone when it rang, and I said, yeah, hi, this is Cheryl. And I heard this big voice booming back at me, hi, Cheryl, I'm Dan Kahn, executive director of CNCF. And after CNCF, you can be executive director of your own foundation, or you could start a company, or you could do something else, like be, you know, join one of our member companies. And I was like, hold on, what? This is the first time I've ever spoken to you. You know, this is an interview. I thought I was supposed to be persuading you why I would be a good fit for just this job. And, uh, and instead, he was telling me, like, after CNCF, you will do these things. I was like, I, I don't know how to respond to this, honestly. Um, but the more I worked with Dan, the more I realized that's how he always thought about his interactions. He always thought, how can I set you up for the future? How can I set you up so you, you have more success and you have more opportunities to do what you want? And I've really tried to take that lesson into all of the interactions that I have with people. Because it's not about whether you can do it today. It's about what can I give you so that two, three, four years down the line, you'll be able to do something more than what you can do now. So that was, that was the first big step where I was like, this is not a typical manager relationship where it's about you know, giving you work to do or giving you tasks to do. So that was my first lesson after CNTF you could be. My second story is called failure is an option. 
Um, this one came probably one or two months after I started CNCF, just trying to figure out what to do. So I talked to a lot of people, came up with a long list of items that I could potentially work on. I presented those to Dan, my manager, and I told him, so what do you think you know, are the highest priority things? And he listened very carefully to me and he said, Cheryl, failure is an option, right? There's no point thinking endlessly about which is the perfect thing to be doing at this time. Just go and do lots of things, try a lot of different things and get comfortable with the idea that some of them will fail. And that's absolutely okay. Because if you're not comfortable with failure, you can only ever do the things that are already within your scope and things you're already comfortable with. And you can't innovate and you can't drive the future. So get comfortable with failing. Failing is not a bad thing. So that's my second story. And the second lesson I learned, failure is an option. And my third story comes, uh, comes from someone who's message comes from someone who's back here. Um, this was probably a year or two after I was in CNCF. And I started to get a few different opportunities to do things like paid speaking gigs, to advise for startups. I was getting a bit more established within the community. And uh, I was on a one-to-one -one with Chris. And I asked him, is it OK for me to be doing this kind of work? And he said to me, absolutely. You should treat your career like a portfolio. In other words, you need to diversify, right? None of us would sell everything we own to buy Tesla or to buy Bitcoin. And yet, within our careers, mostly we think, and our companies want us to work 100% on just what that company is doing. So how can you sort of square these two ideas? For me, the answer was community. It was going to talk to a lot of different people and hearing about what everybody's doing and hearing about what opportunities are out there so that you can expose yourself to new ideas that you won't be able to find on your own. So treat your career like a portfolio. Talk to a lot of different people. You know, you're here today, right? How many new people did you meet today? Or did you just talk to people that you already know? Like the way that you can expand what you're doing is to talk to people you don't know. So those are my three things that I learned at CNCF. One, after CNCF, you could be. Think about how you set other people up for future success. Number two, failure is an option. Get comfortable with failure. There's always something that you can share with people. Number three, treat your career like a portfolio. Diversify. Don't just focus on the one thing. Okay. Next half of my presentation, 10 predictions for cloud native in 2021. So let me sort of rewind a little bit and you know, these are my these are very much my predictions for 2021. So come some of these come from end users that I've talked to. Some of these are trends that I see in projects. Um, but they're just my opinions. So I'll be very interested to see if you agree or not. First of all, a little bit of review about how cloud native has got to where it is today and why it's still accelerating. So this chart comes from a, uh, a report from 2020. And they asked people, are you using more cloud because of COVID-19 or less cloud? So the, right, the, the red side, the left-hand side, people said less cloud and you know, the green side is more cloud. So you can see you know, COVID accelerated everything, including cloud usage. So I think this number is about 60% 60, 60 said that they used more cloud due to COVID-19. So next, uh, Kubernetes job searches grew by 2,000 plus percent in four years. And in the Linux Foundation 2020 open source jobs report, 69% of hiring managers said they're looking for cloud and container expertise, which is fantastic for everybody sitting in this room, of course. There's definitely still a lack of expertise or lack of people. 
Some more numbers. Uh, this comes from the CNCF survey in 2020. We found that 83% of respondents said they run Kubernetes in production. 92% run containers in production. And this graph on the right shows you, you know, the left-hand side was from 2016, and then each one is a subsequent survey up to 2020. And you can see, you know, we've gone from 23% on the left up to 92% today. Um, actually, I should ask, like, how many people run containers in production? Yeah. I would say, like, easily three quarters. How many people run Kubernetes in production? Actually, probably about three quarters as well. Nice. I was interested to see if there was a difference, a gap, like to ask people what they use. But I do think containers and Kubernetes now are, you know, pretty, pretty de facto. This picture on the left is from my first KubeCon, the one that I went to in Berlin, I believe, in 2017. You can just about see on the corner of that at the time, there were seven projects within CNCF. And today we are at more than 100. And those projects come with 136,000 contributors and 6.7 million contributions. And these are just measured off GitHub. So pull requests, comments, commits, issues. Um, there's even more people who are not using GitHub who still contribute towards these projects. Um, and this map shows you where the contributors come from. So there's still quite a big circle that represents the US, you know, big clump in uh, Europe and also in China. The flip side of all this is cloud native is getting really, really complex compared to even a few years ago. And this question was asked in the last CNCF survey about what are your challenges in using and deploying containers so a couple of years ago, the top things were generally technical problems, things like storage, networking, monitoring. Nowadays, the top two on the left-hand side, the joint first ones, complexity, cultural changes with the development team. So those are our top two challenges now. Things like finding vendor support is down this end. You know, there are enough vendors in this space now. Uh, and I just want to show you this video because I think it's just fun. Hold on. The DoD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative is a joint team with the DoD CIO, uh, OSD, uh, the Air Force, and, and DISA. So we're really trying to streamline the process um, and what it takes to, uh, to take a, a program to DevSecOps using uh, Kubernetes and OCI compliant containers. So giving us the ability to, uh, to move faster and be able to continuously push software and update software, particularly when it comes to AI and machine learning uh, and cyber offense and defense is, is critical. For us, of course, security is a, is a must. Uh, that's why we, we call it DevSecOps. The, the SEC is not just you know doing some uh, static dynamic analysis on your code, that's the given. We're going to, uh, to the continuous monitoring side of the house with zero trust baked in, uh, with a, a behavior detection model. Uh, really pushing the envelope when it comes to, to security and uh, kind of merging the best practices on, on the cyber side with the, DevSec, the DevSecOps community. We went to the team and said, you know, can you uh, put Kubernetes and Istio on the jet? And we didn't want to change the, the hardware of the jet, so that's legacy hardware, uh, no, no cheating. That had to be able to boot uh, from scratch in two minutes uh, with uh, the microservices and uh, the, the Istio stack running. Um, and what was incredible is the team was able to bring Go, Java, Python, and modern programming languages using microservice uh, architecture uh, as well. So we had Go running on the jet, uh, which you know is a big difference from Ada. So we were able to do that in 45 days. This is pretty incredible because once you can you can deploy uh, fast and iterate and learn fast and, and fail fast but don't fail twice for the same reason. I think the, the key aspect there is that it's, it's compounding the, the time savings and it's, it's very tough to, to have a very precise number but we're thinking at least 100 years was saved across the 37 programs already. If Kubernetes is good enough for the DoD and our weapon systems, it's certainly good enough for your business. 
it's a bit ridiculous, right? I mean, it's very American, but I love it. Um, I, I think it's just funny because it shows you that like four years ago, who would have thought the US military would be interested in this open source stuff? And uh, they're very excited about it. So yeah, just, it's cool, just funny. We don't need to watch it again. All right. So upshot of everything I just told you, cloud native deployments are getting more complex, getting bigger. There's more projects, more everything in this space. So I want to show you a little bit of what I see coming next. OK, so I've loosely grouped these 10 predictions into three spaces. Um, they're not in any order, but the first one I call tech, so things to do with tools, technologies, frameworks, stuff like that. Second one, loosely, DevOps, um, things to do with people and processes. And then ecosystem, the things to do with uh, larger teams, businesses, things between businesses. OK, so this is interesting. Um, cloud Native is very strongly associated with Go. And if you look at the top 10 programming languages that the CNCF projects are written in, Go is by far the top one. But Rust, where the green arrow is, is at number six. Rust is relatively new. Actually, how many people here have used Rust? Yes. Yeah, like five, six? Yeah, it's relatively new, and yet we're starting to see it come up more and more in cloud native projects. Um, and I think this could be a really interesting trend. Like Rust is something that um, I would love to spend a bit more time on myself. I think this could be, this could be an interesting trend. Number two, cross cloud becomes more real. I think we would say that running on a single cloud now is pretty well understood. Running hybrid cloud between on-prem and a cloud provider, public cloud provider, uh, is possible, it's doable. Running multi-cloud is still pretty difficult. Um, I went to a really great talk by Ricardo uh, earlier today and um, where he was pointing out how they use different, different cloud providers to provide different things. Um, so I think it is, it's kind of getting there. I would say it's not fully real yet. And I come from a storage background. So I find the question of how do you manage data across different clouds very interesting. Um, I think that is the bit that, yeah, we are not quite there yet. But I look forward to cross cloud becoming more real. WebAssembly and eBPF, these two technologies have nothing in connection with each other. Um, and also Liz gave a fantastic eBPF keynote this morning, so I'm not going to go into it. But what I find interesting about these two technologies is that they enable you to run containers and Kubernetes in environments that were previously very dif difficult or very unexpected. So that enables you to run cloud native in new modes. And one of those new modes is Kubernetes for the edge. So when I say edge here, um, at the top, I have their public cloud and a centralized data center. In the middle, an edge data center. And then at the bottom, IoT devices. So as you move further down this stack, you're getting you know, risky devices, unreliable connections, delays, um, dropped connections. Um, so all the challenges are, get harder and harder as you move down this stack. But there were a lot of telcos, I noticed Swisscom was here today, who are very interested in using Kubernetes to run for the edge because it's a really nice paradigm to be able to take one container image and deploy it simultaneously across thousands of IoT devices or other devices. So I think this is, again, a kind of up and coming use case for Kubernetes. I've not seen it implemented uh, widely but I think it is an up, up and coming trend. So if you're in telco or you're interested in telco, then we have some edge working groups you might be interested in. 
Okay, I think that's the end of the tools and technologies ones. Switching to uh, DevOps people and processes ideas, GitOps grows significantly. Um, so GitOps is the idea that you put everything, declare everything in YAML, version it using Git, deploy using something like, have Argo or Flux or something like that, monitor it and have Kubernetes at one time apply all of those changes to your running systems. And then you do that in a loop. So everything is always stored in Git. You have a nice audit trail. You can diff things. Um, I'm curious here, actually, how many people would have something like this already running? Yeah, like maybe a third of people here. Um, so I think GitOps is a really nice paradigm. I mean, as I said, I come from an application developer perspective. So from my point of view, if you can hide a lot of the complexity of the infrastructure, it makes for a really nice developer experience. Um, similarly, there is a working group for GitOps, which you should check out if you are interested. Number six, chaos engineering practices. Okay, I'm gonna ask this one first. How many people are doing something like chaos engineering? Like three people. Okay, this one is aspirational for me because I think chaos engineering is a fantastic idea and I'm always surprised that it's not very widely um, used or adopted at the moment. So the idea with chaos engineering is you run two multiple versions of your service, one is called staging, one is production, you run a sidecar on each of your services, and then you use something like Envoy or another service, service mesh to add some uncertainty within your system. So say 50% 50, 50 of requests, you add a 10 second delay, and then you just see what happens. Okay. Which services fall over, which services do well, what other problems does that cause down the line? Um, and this is nice, this is a little bit like vaccines. You inject a little bit of harm into your system and it improves the overall strength and the stability of the system. So I, I would love to see chaos engineering become more widely adopted. Number seven, rise of FinOps. So this survey comes from last year again. And they asked the respondents, um, what are your top cloud initiatives this year? The number one one was optimize the existing use of cloud, in other words, cost savings. And the fifth or sixth one is better financial reporting on cloud costs. And pretty much every company that I've spoken to recently has said, we need to get a better handle, we need to be able to do accounting and billing and yeah, we just need to be able to manage our cloud costs more effectively. FinOps is an entire movement behind this idea that you should be able to better control your cloud spend. And there is actually a sister foundation to CNCF called FinOps Foundation. So if this is something that you're looking into right now, then I would check out the FinOps Foundation Uh, I think we're onto ecosystem, yes. Um, my number eight prediction, pluggable Dev and Ops experience. So as we said, cloud native has become more and more complicated. We now expect everybody to learn more and more concepts. And it means the onboarding curve is like this, right? Um, I think at Google, there was a joke for it takes six months to run one application and then like 10 seconds to run the next 10,000. Because it takes you six months just to learn and understand the concepts. But then once you have it, you can scale it super, super easy. So the idea is to shrink that six months and make it easier to onboard people onto Kubernetes. Um, and a lot of companies write their own dashboards for this kind of thing. Um, and this one is an open source one that comes from Spotify. It's called Backstage. It's been adopted by quite a few different companies. Um, and it shows you things like cloud costs, security issues, your incidents. Um, and it's just a much nicer experience for developers, for operators. And it's pluggable, meaning that more and more products can actually plug, like write plugins for it and feed data into it. Um, and of course, it's an open source project. So if you are kind of struggling with 
helping application developers figure out what cloud native is, what your infrastructure looks like. Um, I would suggest taking a look at Backstage. Number nine, service mesh consolidation. I think Liz already asked the question this morning about uh, how many people are using service mesh. And uh, it's not that many, from what I remember. And part of the reason is that there are so many uh, service meshes out there. Uh, it's not really clear which is the common best solution, let's say. Um, I just put the diagram of, on the left from Monzo, which is a UK-based startup bank. Uh, and this was a picture of their services and the communication lines between each of them. Uh, and basically service mesh is to help make that diagram less ugly and terrifying. Um, so at the moment, there's probably you know 10 service meshes. And I think in you know maybe another year or two, those will probably, those choices will collapse down as we get sort of more, more kind of movement behind a single one, or maybe two. And last trend, end user driven open source. So obviously, I said before, I was running the end user community. I'm very involved with the end users. And uh, one of the things that we launched at CNCF last year was the end user technology radar. Because what I found out is end users mainly want to hear from other end users. Like you don't really want to hear from, uh, from marketing vendor pitches all the time. So the goal of this radar was to show off what end users are really using, what they're really thinking, and what they suggest, what they recommend to other people. So we stole this format from, uh, from ThoughtWorks and said, you know, things in the bottom half in adopt are things that are widely used, things that in trial, things that you, know, you should look at if you have an interest in it, um, and assess the things that are either on their way out or people are you know, not quite ready, because they're not quite ready to use it yet. And uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, we just launched the next one. We, I'm not going to see NCF, Katie just launched the next one, um, which is about DevSecOps. Uh, you can also go to radar.cncf.io to read every single report. We've had reports on uh, databases, multi-cluster management, CICD, um, secrets management, a lot of the different topics that are currently tricky with cloud native. So I think this is a really good way. If you're, if you're trying to answer the question, what do other people use right now? Then I would go to this radar to check it out. Uh, and a quick summary of everything that I've just talked about. So three things that I learned at CNCF. After CNCF, you could be like set people up for future success. Think about how you can invest in other people and give them opportunities. Failure is an option. Get comfortable with failure. Get comfortable with trying a lot of different things, and some of those will work and some of them won't. Treat your career like a portfolio. Get into the community, meet a lot of people, get a lot of, hear about all the different things that are going on, and that's how you'll find the opportunities. Uh, the second half, cloud native deployments are getting more complex, so staying on top of what's coming next. Here are my list of 10 predictions again. On the tech side, I think we'll see more cloud native projects written in Rust. Cross cloud is becoming more real ish. Uh, WebAssembly and eBPF will enable cloud native to run in different modes, different ways that were not, not available before. Um, and we'll see more and more telcos doing Kubernetes on the edge. On the DevOps side, GitOps will grow significantly. Well, it's already clearly used by a lot of people here, but I think GitOps um, is a really great paradigm. Um, chaos engineering practices, maybe, maybe, I can hope. And the rise of FinOps, because everybody needs to control their cloud costs. And then on the ecosystem side, pluggable developer and operator experiences, like let's just make it easier for people to start using cloud native, start using infrastructure. Um, service mesh consolidation and hopefully more adoption of a fewer number of projects. And then end user driven open source. Um, I think the end users are the ones who are really going to drive what projects are coming next, what paradigms will win out. 
And uh, one more fun video for you, if we have time. Again, this is one that I just like, but um, this one comes from Adidas, a European company, I may point out. So Kubernetes was, for us, a platform built by engineers for engineers. So it's really relieving the teams from really the heavy lifting task from the infrastructure, but at the same time giving them the visibility of what is uh, behind the YAML file. The main pain point that we were addressing was the developer experience before. Uh, so with our, with our old process on VM-based, um, it took developers to, to get a machine. It took them sometimes days or weeks. That feels like being an artist with the hands tied on the back, right? Paint a picture like that, that's impossible. Kubernetes bring to us the possibility of uh, being much faster. Much faster in the way how we build the application. So for example, in our e shop, we came from delivery cycles from four to six weeks, and now we are delivering features four or five times a day. We guessed like uh, we will have a few people joining and, uh, and it will be slowly adopted, but it was more field of dreams. So we built it and everyone came and wants to use it. And now we are overwhelmed by the demand of, uh, of people joining in the platform. The usage for us of cloud native technologies has grown exponentially in the last year and a half since we really launched globally the platform. So we have right now more than 4,000 pods uh, running in Kubernetes. On number one, focus on day two. Choosing a technology is easy. Installing and configuring it is, is also something that almost everyone can do. But then operating it at scale uh, is something that is very, very, very hard. Number two, what I would really tell anyone is uh, don't underestimate the efforts of training. Everyone that is able to touch a line of code at Adidas, not only our internal engineers, also some of our partners, they come to Zaragoza to our delivery, uh, to our IT hub, and they spend a full week with us delivering an application end-to-end. -end. We also teach our teams to spend at least 50% of their time sitting with the delivery teams, so they really feel the pain and they are really able to direct the platforms to where, they, where the teams need that. The last advice that I will give is apply your company culture to everything that you do. For example, we are really a sports company in our DNA and we love competition. We don't like top-down mandate. We launch our DevOps Cup. So for example, where more than 220 people, engineers, are competing to be the best DevOps team. Cool. I hope you found that fun. I think it's nice to hear some advice from people who've actually done it as well. And uh, I believe that is the end of my Ooh. that is the end of my presentation. These slides are on my blog at oyshow.com. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I've really appreciated being here. I hope you have as well.